excuse me. Good evening. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the Wilmington School Committee for Wednesday, April 24th. If you could please join me in saying our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, I have to say, in a couple of years of being chair, that's the first time I've used the gavel, and it worked. <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. I believe our first order of business is we have a presentation from the Woburn School, Jessica Berry's third grade class. Mr. Stragnus? Mr. Stragnus. <laughs> Sorry about that. If you'd like to introduce, please. Yes. I don't know if you could tell, you had to use the gavel, which means they're really excited to be here. <laughs> Us yes. too. Yes. Um, so for um, April, which is uh, National Poetry Month, we have uh, members of Mrs. Barry's third grade class who are going to come read a poem that they wrote. Um, not all the students could come. Um, so what we did is we made a, um, a book with all the students' um, poems in it for the school committee. So you can have this just so um, the kids know that everybody got a chance to have their poems read. Um, mm -hmm. So Mrs. Barry is going to introduce the students. They're going to come up and read their poem. Thank you. Hi. Um, first up is Karina Jenkins. I think summer is super fun because there's always so much sun. I like to run and jump and play, especially on this nice warm day. I love summer very so because it will not ever snow. When the day comes to an end, I hope it will come back again. Next up is Spencer Walker. Sunshine, sunshine shines everywhere, playing all the time, running and leaping in the great sunshine. Never stop running, groundhogs poking their heads everywhere. <laughs> Molly Kenny. Cheetahs, speedy, fast hunters, fine prey in the habitats, babies are so cute. Okay, next up is Logan Forbush. <clears throat> April vacation. On April vacation, I like to sleep. When I know I have to go back, I will weep. When I go outside to play, it's always so much fun. I always know I'll see the sun. Okay, next up is Emily Laquadera. Hi, I'm Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. I like dogs and cats. My dog's name is Allie, but she's such a brat. I also have a brother. His name is Andrew. He loves the park and plays basketball with you. I like to play with toys. They're called LPS. I love sour candy. I love sour kids. They are so sweet, but this is now the end. Wasn't this a treat? Want to be my friend? Okay, Robbie DiMadeiros. Hockey's my favorite sport. There's always something to see on the board. My family comes to every game. They always have to scream my name. It's Always so fun to see all my teammates jump with glee. Okay, Caitlin Marvin. School. I always miss a school party because they say I'm always tardy. My teacher always says, in the hall, never run or you might fall. There are many fun math tools I like to use because they're cool. When I eat my lunch, I get annoyed to hear my crunch. Brady Cassidy. Sharks. I am a shark. I swim in the dark. I hunt in the ocean and cause a commotion. I live deep down. You won't find me unless you go scuba diving with glee. Okay, Molly Kilburn.
When you were bored. When you were bored, you can do anything like run around or swing on a swing. You could play a board game or just read a book. You could juggle or paint or be a good cook. The choices are endless of what you can do. You can draw, you can jump, and go shopping too. To get rid of the boredom, do all of these things. I really suggest to go on a swing. Okay. Samantha Nelson. Summer. Summer is hot. Summer is cool. Summer is great for swimming in the pool. Summer is great for playing outside like swings, monkey bars, and slides. Summer, there is no school. I don't like school because it's not cool. Lunch, recess, gym, and dinner. I like them all because they're all a ball. I don't like school because it's not cool. <laughs> okay, Leah Doucette. Spy Cat. Spy Cat is my... Spy Cat, My Cat, Ella Avery's 2, Tyler, Chase, Burping Twin, Super Kitten 2, Devil's Rapid Fire Blast with Icy Angel Cat, Nyan Cat goes on and leaves his super sticky cat splat, Super Team Bloopers Team, mistakes are always fine, Dorita, Spy Cat's favorite tree is always time to dine, Super Team Bloopers Team, fighting all the time, yet always watches together when it's time to fight crime. We all will, we all, are cats, and that is that. Okay, and last up is Ella Avery. The crazy teacher. I have a crazy teacher. Her name is Mrs. Creature. You may think her name's the weirdest thing, but it's her favorite feature. She also makes us write a 10-page essay every day. And oh, the math, the math, the math, the math. It's, when you're, it's like when you're eight and still take a bath. During recess, it's just never a bunch of fun. We pay all day long until she makes us sing a very high-pitched song. All my friends crowd around my class, wondering why we're singing about a bunch of gas. Me watching in embarrassment, thinking about running across the world and living in a tent. And lunch. Now we have two rhymes, we pick them around like a bright silver dime. Heads or tails? Tails, no heads. Okay, it's heads. So I don't know how to say it, but bunches of lunches. Last and fall begins to fall. We get two hours of poetry, which I don't hate at all. So I guess Miss Feature's not so bad, but wait until you meet my dad. <laughs> Those are great. Thank you very much for sharing your poetry with us. Thank we appreciate it. And we always love having guests, but we understand you may not want to stay through our whole <laughs> meeting this evening, so you are certainly welcome to leave as you wish. Thank you for being here, though. We appreciate it. We'll just give them a minute to exit. Sorry. Okay, no worries. Want to make sure you weren't running away. Okay, no problem. No problem. Okay, the next item of business we have to tackle this evening is our consent agenda. Um, not too many things on here this evening, but I still will go slow. <laughs> uh, the first item is an approval of minutes. These are from our last regular session on April 10th. I believe we were all present with the exception of Mrs. Burns. Um, any changes or discussion on those minutes? Great, I'll ask for a motion to approve, please. Mr. Talbot, I saw your hand. Mrs. Bryson, I saw you as the second. All those in favor? And we have one abstention, Mrs. Burns. Thank you. Uh, next item are the warrants. We have G429, R238, 
L77, L78, L79, FS30. I'll take those a group. Mrs. Burns, the motion to approve. Thank you. Seconded by Mr. Ragsdale. Thank you. All those in favor? That would be unanimous, Tristan. Thank you. And then we'll take up the payroll warrant. This is for week ending April 24th, 2019. I'll motion to approve that, please. Mrs. Newhouse, thank you. Seconded by Mrs. Burns, thank you. All those in favor? That looks unanimous to me. And then we have a circuit breaker warrant, circuit breaker number 22. Motion to approve, please. Mrs. Bryson, thank you. Mr. Talbot with the second. All those in favor? Thank you. We've got one abstention, Mrs. Burns. And finally, we have a SPED warrant, SPED number 43. Could we have a motion to approve, please? Mrs. Bryson, thank you. Mr. Talbot on the second. Thank you. All those in favor? And we've got four with two abstentions, Mrs. Newhouse and Mrs. Burns. And that brings us through our consent agenda. And next up would be our superintendent's report. Dr. Brandt. Thank you, uh, and good evening, everyone. Just a couple of items to bring to your attention. In the packet, there are three, um, uh, sorry, two items and, and one additional one, uh, just to make note. And the first three have to do with searches. It is, as you know, have been a very busy time in the district as we are engaged in and have completed a number of, of searches recently for leaders in the district. I'll first uh, bring your attention and the member of the community's attention to the uh, press release for the Woburn Street School. I've shared this uh, previously, but there's the actual record uh, in here. And uh, again, uh, Ms. Suzanne Sullivan, currently a principal with the Bill Ricca Schools, uh, where she serves as the principal of the Parker Elementary School, uh, is, um, I'm pleased to be able to share, joining us uh, here in the district as the next principal of the Woburn Street School, effective July 1st. Uh, and so that's in there for any members of the community who might be interested in taking a closer look at Ms. Sullivan and her background. Uh, we are gearing up for the um, assistant principal search also at the Woburn Street School. Uh, the posting has been up for that. In fact, I think it's now officially come to a close. I'm pleased to be able to say there has been a tremendous level of interest in that search. Uh, and so we are preparing uh, to embark upon a search for the assistant principal position. And as that moves forward, uh, I'll keep you uh, certainly informed of that. Um, we will have it uh, as a similar principal search, a little bit scaled down somewhat but certainly still involvement uh, for an opportunity for staff to provide feedback for the principal team, the central office team and such to meet with the candidates and collectively provide feedback. And Ms. Sullivan uh, who will also uh, be involved in that search, so we're looking forward to that. Um, the uh, Director of Technology and Digital Learning, there's nothing in your packet, but just uh, to take the opportunity, if I may, to let you know that that search is ongoing. Uh, very active, in fact, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the, a uh, cross-section of uh, stakeholders have met to interview candidates that took place both before the April break and again yesterday. And we are going to, um, as I think I've also mentioned here previously, move forward with that a little bit on a quicker time frame because we know that there are some neighboring districts who are searching for the exact same position. Uh, we will have candidates who uh, will be visiting here uh, later this week and first part of next week. Uh, again, we will, because of the fact that this is a district leader position, uh, take careful steps to ensure that these candidates have the opportunity to meet with um, our district leadership teams, our principals, uh, and we'll go through a collection process uh, of feedback uh, as we move towards a finalist. And again, I'll keep you informed of that search as we move forward. Uh, two final things that are not on the agenda, but just to bring to your attention. Uh, NIASC was visiting uh, the high school here the last two days. Been a very involved uh, and very active couple of two days, I can tell you, uh, for both Ms. Peters and her team. Uh, uh, Dr. Regan, Mr. Ruggiero, and I had the opportunity to meet uh, with uh, the NIASC uh, visiting team yesterday for approximately an hour. But they, uh, they, that they are long days here as they visit classrooms, met with students, met with parents, and so on. And so this is the first part of uh, the NIASC visit process that you might recall. And finally, also related here to the high school, quarter four, believe it or not, for seniors, comes to a close April 26th. So uh, lots happening here at the high school as we really sort of move into the final phase of, uh, of the school year for many. And that's it for uh, myself tonight. Thank you. Great. Any questions or comments for Dr. Brand on his report? No? Okay. Moving right along this evening. <laughs> 
Okay, next item. Under old business, we have some information relating to uh, Dr. Brand's proposal on the Office of Student Support Services reorganization. Dr. Brand. Sure. So um, in the packet is uh, a, uh, a recap of the memo that you've seen here as a committee previously. And again, if not for uh, members of the community who might be interested in this item, uh, it provides, as you recall, a background and overview of this proposal uh, that essentially uh, I'm using the term reorganization because I do believe that it's that. Um, the proposal at the heart of it is really an intention to try and provide increased capacity in terms of personnel uh, within the Department of Student Support Services, as, as I've spoken to previously, uh, an area that uh, there, I think appropriately so, is some concern in terms of our current capacity and an effort to try and expand uh, the support for that department as a whole in service to our programs, of course our schools, uh, our students and their families respectively. The heart of this uh, reorganization really involves uh, repurposing an existing position that is the special education CTL uh, and with your support hopefully this evening uh, the approval and allowance for us to create a new administrative position uh, that's not in the contract. It is a full-time administrator. It, it's an administrative position outside of the contract. Uh, the coordinator of special education pre-K to 12. Uh, seeking your um, your hopeful vote uh, this evening again to prove the creation of that. We'll continue to, as I've also mentioned, work closely with the WTA uh, towards uh, the ratification of of this. Uh, it is a contract-related item because the special education CTL is in the contract. Uh, but um, uh, we have had uh, many promising uh, discussions with the WTA president, and I'm, uh, I know that we're moving towards uh, that resolution here. Happy to take any questions uh, if you have any on the uh, proposal here this evening. Mrs. Barnes. Um, I'll try to keep it <coughs> brief, but I, I very much support the intent and in, in the um, in in this new plan going forward. Um, I do think it, it'll bring, um, and I'm hoping it'll bring more efficiency and effectiveness um, to that area of um, special education uh, as it pertains directly to our students and their IEPs and the team team meetings. Um, not that it has basis to their decision for this evening. I, I, I would like to just caution um, that with this transition and as you I mean, I know you have work to do with the WTA to negate this into the contract. Um, I do hope that it, it that with this point six teaching position being absorbed by current staff, that it's um, done so that that through that transition that the staff who are absorbing it aren't impacted grossly. I'm not looking for. I can't find the right descriptive, but in that if there are checkpoints, so that if staff are in the transition. Um, I've taken on that added role. There's check-ins with them to support them in that process, so the least amount of disruption to our students and in their learning environment, um, you know, does it doesn't occur if I'm saying that this way. I want to, but that's I just wanted to share that in that process. If I if I may, Please. and thank you for the point. Um, uh, let me. Uh, I hope it goes without saying uh, two things. One that. If there was a hint of concern as it relates to the ability uh, or the capacity of the, the current, based upon the current landscape of student needs, as is known at the high school, if there was concern about the ability of the existing staff to be able to appropriately mm -hmm. absorb uh, the students and their respective needs on education plans, this would be a very different proposal. Okay. Uh, and it wouldn't seek to repurpose uh, the current um, funds, if you will, the budget that's associated with this proposal. Uh, that's based upon the landscape that's currently exists right now. Okay. And arguably, I, I, or I would make that same argument uh, in this particular case for special education at any of our schools and staffing that the budget proposal, the budget that you have previously approved and is moving forward to the town is based upon the current needs that we know at this time. But the second thing uh, that hopefully is important to note and goes without saying is that this same effort, this same proposal that's here, and that is the addition of or the creation of a new administrative position. Um, quite honestly, as I've come to learn what I have about the district and where we're at, specifically in the department, um, I would have been making this proposal to you. It may not have exactly aligned with the budget where, with where we were at the time, back in, you know, starting that budget planning in October, November, but this is the right, I believe, decision that's uh, necessary to help provide enhanced 
capacity within the department. Um, I mean, said another way, if we still needed this 0.6 FTE for service delivery at the high school, uh, this proposal would still be before you. It might mm -hmm. be funded in some other way, but I think it's a necessary uh, step. I agree. Thank okay. you for that clarification. Appreciate it. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Ragsdale? Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, echo Mrs. Burns' comment and uh, about the teaching staff. And I, I would hope that um, that we would do a check-in on this um, at some point in the future just to make sure that the landscape as it looks right now continues to obtain into the future and that we don't feel that we need that additional um, digital t uh, teaching support. Um, but uh, I think that from, from where we are right now that this, this definitely looks like the, the right move to make. Um, and I also just wanted to ask quickly about um, on uh, page three of your original memo, you listed uh, several key next steps. Um, the approval from the school committee is we're looking at tonight. You discussed the um, engaging with the WTA, and there are just a few more elements in there about finalizing the job description and uh, revised uh, organizational chart and so forth. I was just wondering if those have been completed or if they are also just kind of in, in process. Uh, thank you for drawing attention to that. Um, so still in process very much so, uh, but with, um, uh, w in, sp in particular with note to the organizational chart and really the impact that this, uh, that this will have on, on the staff and the services within the program. As this is finalized, it's my intent to, to do two things. Um, whether or not it catches the very end of the year in coordination with your meetings here, that may have to be determined, but certainly to, to make sure that staff are crystal clear on, on, on what the impact of this plan is and how it may affect <clears throat> them, who they're reporting to, the evaluational components. I don't mean students, I mean staff. Um, and, and any other changes that relates to that, uh, it will be uh, my intention to make sure that staff are made aware of this. And this is brought back here. I mean, this I see this as a, clearly as an administrative position that has impact on our leadership across the district. I think it's only appropriate uh, to, to bring that for, for, your, uh, uh, for, for your knowledge, for your awareness as a governing body, uh, and certainly for the community as a whole. So. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Burns? I was just going to share, um, certainly now that we've had a little time to think about this, uh, Mrs. Burns and I, I think we're the, the last two members that were part of the discussion the last time we considered the Office of Student Support Services and the staffing and how that group was organized. And I remember back then thinking, geez, that's a, that's a really big job. And I had some concerns, to be honest. But now flash forward to a couple years, we've seen how things have played out and where we're at now. Reading this proposal makes sense to me. It, it seems like it's the next logical step. Yes, there's some more work to do, and I would certainly hope to, to your point, Mr. Ragsdale, and also yours, Mrs. Burns, that we would continue to evaluate this and make sure that this is working for our staff and certainly for our students. Um, but this seems like a logical next step for, for me, being through that process before. So I just thought I would share that. Okay. Seeing no further, oh, sure, this is Bryson. I agree with you, and I also think at the last meeting when we first saw this, it was made clear that this had already been thought through as far mm -hmm. as coverage for the students, and that was one of our first questions. Do we actually, can we actually do this? Does this yeah. make sense? And it was, I thought it was pretty clear that yes, it did make sense, but I would reiterate what everyone has said, that we need to make sure that we're providing those services and make sure, but mm -hmm. it, Alice seemed to feel like it was, this was going to work yeah. just fine with the reduction and all of that. So I don't know if it would be helpful to see those numbers, if it would help people to see more clearly how many students are being served. But I feel like it was, it seemed to be pretty straightforward that there was going, it wasn't going to be difficult to reallocate. If, if I may uh, mm -hmm. comment to that. I think um, it, that's not so much where my concerns lie as, mu as much as the staff members. I guess what I'm thinking is that with special education and teachers, almost 50% burnout within two, a two-year process. And, um, and as we know in, in the discussion too, that that department has only seen growth with regards to more mandates and more children in needs and more services that we, our district supplies. So I guess my, um, and, and I don't know what it looks like, so I'm kind of um, speaking blindly, but I want to ensure that that small role that that point six played here at the high school, um, that the staff who are taking it on um, have the right support so that they, they can take on that role 
Um, and it may be nothing, you know, it may be nothing that can't just kind of fit like a puzzle piece into what they're doing. I just, I, I guess my concern just lies, I just want to make sure that they um, have the times, resources, and tools to be able to absorb whatever that role played um, so that there's no, you know, disruption with regards to the, the students that they teach. I think that's where my focus really kind of lied. Um, mm -hmm. Go ahead. And do we have a sense of how the teachers feel about this reorganization, especially at the high school? Has that have, do we have a sense? Uh, I have not asked them specifically or directly. I know that Alice has had uh, ongoing conversations with the current special education CTL in the role. Mm -hmm. So through, through that process, um, we've not sort of canvassed for uh, a, a opinion per se or feedback, but certainly that linkage of, you know, from the district leadership uh, with the building leadership. I've talked with Ms. Peters uh, about this as we've started to uh, strategize, around, strategize around what the impacts are on that, on that level as well, too. So um, uh, it, it's a fair question, but actual each member, I've not directly engaged. Each well, member. I figured that, but, but I meant like, yeah. is there a sense of, is there pushback where we're here and there's some, wait a minute, what are we doing? Or are they sort of like, no, I mean, I thought when we, this first was brought to us, it seemed to make very good sense and clearly we've seen the need for it. I mean, it's very clear we need this support. The, so I would imagine I mean, this has they been would... socialized, if you will, if I can use that term, uh, now for some time. And I know I have not, uh, and to my knowledge, Alice has not received any direct uh, feedback to say this is this is off base. We can't do this. Uh, I certainly will say the same thing in my conversations with Miss Peters that started some time ago, uh, from the sense of what this would mean on a on a building uh, on a day to day basis. And it is more here. Again, the CTL currently supports, as you know, both the middle school and high school, but the service delivery component is here, uh, and there's not been that sense of to say, whoa, this is going to be a problem. So. Mr. Rapstow. Uh, one more thing to add on that uh, we should remember that uh, it's not only the having the teaching support that is part of the support for special education teachers, but in fact, the administrative support is a crucial part of it, and that's what we're trying to address here. And so there's, uh, you know, an important aspect of, you know, that we should be hoping to make things easier and improve things for the special education teachers in the, you know, in the rooms uh, by providing them with more administrative support and having someone in a full-time role to uh, coordinate special education in the district. Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Mrs. Newhouse. I just want to say, I was the co-chair on the CPAC when this was brought forward and seeing how it's played out the last what, three, four years since the change for the student support services. Um, it's been an ongoing conversation. I know at that level until I was there in August that this is definitely something that's been needed in that department. Um, you know, I had the same concerns the last meeting of, you know, the teaching support, but it sounds that, but it seems as though both Dr. Brand and Ms. brown Legrand um, have done their homework in, um, you know, Hopefully that plays out, and if we see that it's affecting the kids and the staff, then you know, come September, October, we can relook at it, and if we need to add on that additional support. Great, thank you. Anything else? No. Okay. <laughs> so we have before us a, a request to vote on this and accept this. So the. If I'm hearing no further discussion, I'm feeling as though we're, we're ready to make a decision here. General, okay, so the recommended motion before us is to approve the Office of Student Support Services reorganization and the creation of a 1.0 FTE or full-time equivalent position of coordinator of special education pre-K through 12. Would somebody like to offer that as a motion, Ms. Dragsdale? Seconded by Mrs. Newhouse. All those in favor? It looks like unanimous to me, Kristen. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, moving on to new business. I believe first up is a overview of our winter athletics here at the high school, and I think we have Mr. Albert, who's going to give us some information. Come on down. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, in your packets, I put through the uh, winter sports update. Uh, 
boys basketball coached by Dennis Ingram, who is a Wilmington High alum. Uh, made the state tournament this past year uh, and had a Middlesex League All-Star in Stephen Anthony. Uh, more importantly, the boys basketball team did some nice community service. Uh, they did a food drive that went to the Wilmington Food Pantry and students volunteered with Wilmington Travel Basketball throughout the school year. Uh, girls basketball, coached by Jessica Robbins, a Wilmington High faculty member, uh, beat Lynn Classical in the state tournament this year. Uh, Middlesex League All-Stars, we're fortunate to have three, uh, Gabby Bond, Kylie Ducham, and Jenna Tavanese. And girls basketball did community service uh, with Wilmington Travel Basketball, as well as a breast cancer awareness game. Uh, cheerleading, uh, coached by Christina Zucaro, Wilmington High alum, uh, had a great season, placed first in the Middlesex League, uh, also Division Three North Regionals came in second place, and fourth place in the state tournament, and then all the way to New England, they came in fifth place. Uh, during the regular season, they won three invitationals, and cheerleading team does more community service than any other team uh, in the school. Uh, just to be brief, uh, I won't mention the stuff they did in the summer and the fall, but this past winter they volunteered at the tree lighting ceremony and also doing arts and crafts with the elderly at Windsor Estates. Uh, ice hockey, coached by Stephen Scanlon, uh, Wilmington High alum, uh, made the state tournament, uh, also won the Haverhill Invitational during the regular season and had Middlesex League All-Stars Ryan Barrett and Conlon Duffy. And boys hockey did community service. They did cancer awareness games and military awareness games. <coughs> uh, girls ice hockey, coached by John Lapiana, uh, had their best season as a standalone program. Uh, best season since the 2009-2010 season. Uh, Leah Karkutis was the Middlesex League All-Star. And the girls team volunteered at Rosie's Place uh, Soup Kitchen at the beginning of the season. Uh, swimming, for the first time ever, uh, the inaugural season was a success with the cooperative team with North Reading High School. Uh, coach Sue Hunter uh, from North Reading, uh, Wilmington, was the head coach. And Emma Ryan of Wilmington High School uh, qualified for the state meet. Uh, Wilmington High had four uh, male students participate on the team and six female students. So uh, overall, it was a great success, and, and thank you for the support of it. Uh, wrestling, coached by Joel McKenna, Wilmington High alum. Uh, had three All-Stars, Shane Penny and Joe Ganley. And also Joe Ganley was a sectional champion as well. And Wilmington Youth Wrestling, uh, the WHS team volunteered with Wilmington Youth Wrestling uh, as a community service initiative this past winter. Uh, indoor track, coached by Mike Kinney, a Wilmington High faculty member. We had league all-stars Greg Adamick, Sam Vince, Tyler Thomas. Also Kevin Eldred, Brian Eldred, Sean Riley, and Greg Adamick placed eighth in the Division Four meet. Uh, ben Packer placed eighth in the two mile. And Sean Riley won the state freshman sophomore meet in the 600. Uh, Wilmington indoor track for the girls side. Uh, coach Brian Shell, Wilmington High alum, was the head coach. Uh, Emma Garrity was Division IV state champion in the 600. Uh, she was also named Middlesex League All-Conference, uh, Middlesex League All-Star. Uh, other All-Stars were Evelyn Miller-Nuzo, Hannah Levita, Catherine McLaughlin, and Amy Russell. Thank you very much. Any, any questions from Mr. Alberts? Mr. Ragsdale. What is the participation like in winter sports compared to fall and spring? Uh, you know, it's a smaller uh, offering of sports, uh, but some of the teams that are, are larger, uh, we have non-cut sports, uh, indoor track and outdoor track, uh, but there's more offerings when we have outdoor space available uh, in the fall and the spring. Uh, so, you know, overall we have just under 45% of the students participate in athletics. So uh, winter's a little smaller with, you know, basketball has set number of teams, and set number of spots. Uh, so it is a little lower than usual. So fall is our, our largest season, uh, then winter and then spring is our second largest, so. Thanks. Yeah. 
Any other questions? Um, I was just going to ask the question. I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it publicly anyway. Um, for winter sports, which ones required a waiver? Meaning that we needed to ask younger kids to come up. Yep. Uh, girls ice hockey, uh, okay. we had the eighth grade waiver. Yep. Uh, every school in our division in the Middlesex League also had that waiver. So it's very important uh, yeah. for the program. And we had one girl uh, participate come on the up team. From eighth yeah. grade. Okay, great. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Any other questions, Mr. Phillips? No? All right. Great. Thank, Thank you. you for your presentation Thank as you. always. All right. Next up, we have the Reader's <coughs> Workshop presentation. I believe, Dr. Regan, you're going to take us through that? I will. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Yes. So we've had a, a few sort of curriculum spotlights that have happened. We've uh, heard about world language and we've heard about um, our art program, visual arts program. So tonight I'm just going to bring folks up to speed on where we are with our elementary literacy program, which you've probably heard as Reader's Workshop, soon to be Writer's Workshop. Um, it is the Lucy Calkins, um Units of Study, that's the curriculum, and the Reader's Workshop and Writer's Workshop is the modality that we use um, to deliver that um, curriculum. So as you're probably aware, but just for the public, um, we um, are connected with TLA, um, Teaching and Learning Alliance, which is a regionalized, it's, it's local, they do most of their work in New England. They are you know, branching out into other parts of the country now, but they are experts on um, instruction. And we have coaches that are assigned to each elementary school through TLA, and this has been a relationship Wilmington has had with them now, we're in our fourth year. Uh, it's very successful. I've met almost all of the coaches. Our uh, primary contact from TLA is quite excellent. She's actually a Wilmington uh, uh, born and raised. She doesn't live here anymore, but she's a product of the Wilmington Public Schools. Um, and she's just uh, really, really quite excellent. We have multiple coaching sessions a year for each elementary school. Um, because of our longstanding relationship, we were able to apply for scholarship days this year, and we were awarded uh, two and a half additional days at no charge. Um, so Holly Banishevitz and I decided that we would use that time to actually work with the leadership as opposed to uh, adding more time into the coaching because we felt like while the teachers were working on honing their skills in workshop, it's important also to have the leadership at the elementary level know what to look for when they go in and they give feedback during informal or formal observations. So we did a half-day workshop with her, just sort of in a conference room, just talking about those look-fors and what you should be giving for feedback and what you should expect to see in a typical workshop model lesson. And then we used the remaining two days to be in the four upper elementary. So we didn't do the two early childhood centers, but we did involve those directors. Uh, we just didn't tour those schools. So we went to the Shasheen, for example, for a half a day, visited almost every classroom, and in that visit there was the Shasheen principal, the Woburn Street principal coming over, um, Holly, myself, and, T and Shannon from TLA. And then a week later we did the same thing with the same group over at the Woburn Street, and then we did a similar model at the North and West with the principals from those two buildings. So they were you know, able to see each other's buildings from the other side of the town, which was nice. Um, but it was, you know, we'd walk in, we'd spend a few minutes in there, we'd engage with kids if we could, step out in the hall and have a quick conversation about what did you see, what did you think, what kind of feedback would you give this teacher if you were doing a formal observation. Um, at the end of that, we gave all the positives back to the staff. This was not an, a, a formal evaluation, so we shared with them all the great things that we saw. Um, which were all true, so we weren't making things up, so we saw a lot of great things, so to make it sort of a feel good and make staff feel comfortable. Um, so that was good use of time, I think, for us this year. Uh, the focus for last year and this year has been on the issue of conferring, which I'll talk about in just a moment, but that's sort of at the heart of the workshop model. Um, again, I'll elaborate a little bit in a moment, but that's really been our focus with TLA and teachers. Um, and the writing workshop shift is sort of starting now. Next year, as again, I'll tell you at the end of the presentation, you'll see a graphic, but next year we will officially launch Writer's Workshop in certain grades. Um, we've had professional development on Writer's Workshop this year. We don't expect the transition to Writer's Workshop to be quite as jolting as it was to do Reader's Workshop a couple years ago because it's the same idea, it's the same structure. 
Um, it's just a writing curriculum versus a reading curriculum, but the structure is exactly the same. So teachers should be able to make that transition um, a little bit easier. And I don't want you to think kids aren't writing if they're not doing writer's workshop, they're just using other methods that they've been using you know, in the past. So it's not that we're not writing at the elementary level, we just haven't adopted the program officially um, or implemented the program officially yet. So our program is a balanced literacy program, which has, it can have many different um, definitions. Um, you know, in Wilmington, we think of it as, as a program that, that um, gives explicit teaching in reading and explicit teaching in writing, and then there's a word study component. Um, right now, we have a word study program that goes up to grade two. Next year, we will be piloting a word study program for grades three, four, and five with the hope to adopt a program the following year so that we will have a word study or phonics program that goes from grades K through five. Right now it stops um, in Wilmington at grade two. Um, and that was largely because there really weren't well-designed programs out there yet. There are now two programs that we'll be piloting next year, um, one by Pearson and one by Fontes and Pinnell, um, who also published the Lucy Hawkins um, units of study. So um, we will we'll be looking at that. There'll be more to come around that. Um, but the Balanced Literacy Program really addresses the needs of all learners. It allows teachers to sort of be those informed decision makers around the curriculum and how they can make adjustments as needed sort of on the fly um, to help individual students that may have different needs. Um, that's that flexibility that is involved with a program like this. There's a 90 minute literacy block if a teacher feels like they need to do more with reading on a day than they do on writing than they can. If they feel like they need to spend a little more time on word study they can on that day, so they do have flexibility. 90 minutes is short, so it's something we need to look at down the road to expand that to a 120 minute uh, literacy block a day. Um, so in Wilmington, with 90 minutes, that is a relatively short period of time, so that's something we'll be looking at um, as we go forward. Um, and this balanced literacy program that we have doesn't have an anthology that um, you know students read out of, it's really about having a rich classroom library, and so the last couple of years, we've had a budget line item. It does carry forward to FY20, which is great. That line item survived. Um, and it's about $1,000 per grade level for teachers to buy books for their own classroom library. And it sounds like a significant amount of money, but if you take $1,000 and divide it across seven classrooms at a grade level, it, it, you know, it quickly kind of shrinks. I mean, it's, it's certainly um, a good start. Um, teachers would love to have more, I'm sure, to buy more books, but they are using that money quite eagerly to increase their classroom library. So if you go into an elementary classroom, you'll see them organized in different ways, but they're typically in bins by level, and kids can go up and choose the book that they want to read that's of interest to them at their particular um, reading level. So we choose the workshop, chose the workshop model here like many districts do across the state and across the country. Um, it, it is a good way to sort of incorporate the idea of balanced literacy. Um, it really invites kids to be active in their own learning, so again, gives them the choice of what they want to read in terms of their, their texts. Um, it gives flexibility around how we assess kids. Um, I was observing a class the other day, and they were talking about, in that particular mini lesson, about setting goals as readers, and the teacher laid out a whole bunch of options of things that kids could choose based on where they felt they were at the time. Now, of course, the teacher then goes around and confers and give suggestions if the student's not exactly focused where he or she may think that they should be. Um, but if they want to focus on reading at a just right pace, or they want to focus on um, you know, rereading words or, uh, that confuse them, or looking at pictures for clues, like those are things they can set for their own reading goals and sort of become um, really involved in their own learning and take ownership of that. Um, so that's a key element of the workshop model. And it also allows for a natural level of differentiation because teachers are, as I'll talk about in a moment, when they're going around and conferring with their students, they're able to make adjustments for individual students at any given moment in time um, based on what those students need. I don't want to make it sound like differentiation is simple and because we use this model it happens, you know, I say it's a natural um, conduit for it, but it's still challenging of course for teachers to do and this is something they continue to work and grow around. So just specifically around DI differentiated instructive, instruction workshop, as I said, is really responsive and adaptive. It allows them to respond immediately and make adjustments to their instruction with individual students. 
Um, there's a lot of individual assessment gathering that happens during the conferring, so they're taking notes on individual kids and sort of what the student is struggling with, and I'm gonna circle back in a few minutes and check on you and see how you're doing with that particular skill. Um, so I, I think that's important to note. And it also allows for a lot of collaboration between special educators, reading specialists, um, and classroom teachers to modify when necessary. So the Calkins units of study, um, you know, for some students need to be modified at different levels, some very heavily, um, but they are able to do this so that students can access that um, curriculum. Our students that have the most um, significant disabilities um, around reading or writing, um, it, it is challenging. Those students often are pulled out because they're getting reading services, so it's finding the time, making sure they're not losing classroom instruction time around literacy so that they can get reading instruction. So it's, it's that balance of there's only so many minutes in a day, how do you make sure that they're getting that literacy instruction with their peers and getting the extra help that they need or programming that they need, of Orton-Gillingham or something to that effect. Um, so that's something we're constantly looking at. It, also relates to the master schedule at the elementary school, which goes back to the 90 minutes versus 120 minutes. So this is something that we have to really take a serious look at in the next um, year or two to make sure that we have a plan going forward and how to better utilize those minutes. So there are really three major components to the workshop model. If you were to walk into a classroom at any time during a literacy block K-5, the expectation is that you would see something that kind of unfolds as I'm gonna describe. You'd have a, a very brief mini lesson. This is direct instruction. Kids are sitting on the carpet in front of the teacher and the teacher is um, providing them with a 10 minute tops, a 10 minute lesson um, on the specific skill or goal for that particular day. Um, they're demonstrating a strategy typically. They're using the language that they want students to use, language that comes right out of the Lucy Calkins units. That making predictions uh, graphic that you see there is called an anchor chart. In most of our elementary classrooms, you will see these posted all over the place because there's one that's used for each mini lesson or for each unit, maybe a couple of them, and then they post them up so that students can refer back to them at any time during the year. Um, this is not a Wilmington one. This is one that I pulled offline, but you know, these are very typical to what you might see. So this mini lesson would have been around the idea of making predictions and that language of I think blank because is the language the teacher would use, likely reading an anchor text, and they'd read a passage and say, hmm, I think this because of this. And they're trying to model that exactly for students because after that 10 minute lesson, they're gonna go out and they're gonna do this work themselves. So if you walked in into the meat of the lesson, which is this 30 to 45 minute slot where they're doing independent work, and it can be small group as well, but this independent work section, this is where kids are reading. Um, if it was writer's workshop, they'd be doing their writing. And the teacher is going around <clears throat> and conferring with them, checking in with individuals or with groups. Sometimes if it's a particular skill and they need to pull five kids over to work with them, they may do that and it will be a teacher and five students in a group while others are independently reading. Sometimes they're reading buddy books and they're reading to each other and listening to each other, but they always have a specific skill that they're supposed to be practicing either alone or with each other. It's pretty amazing to walk into a room and see this portion of the lesson because it can be absolutely frenetic or it can be like library quiet. Um, and it works either way, right? So kids are told to just find a place you're comfortable. They'll be under desks, they'll be curled up in a corner, they have beanbag chairs, they have, I mean, all kinds of things I've never imagined you would sit on that teachers have turned into comfy chairs. Um, the idea is find a place you're comfortable physically and also emotionally, right? That's why some kids like to, they wanna be private where they read, so they find a little nook under, literally under a desk and they're sitting and they're reading quietly there. Um, you know, some of them have to read out loud to themselves, so they go into the corner and they do that. So it's really neat to watch, and that's when the teacher is going around with his or her conferral notes, and they're talking to that student about their reading. They're asking them to read to them, and they're making notations around sort of, what's that one thing that I'm concerned about? They use that reader's workshop, the Lucy Calkins language, to say, you know, you know, strong readers do this. I want you to practice that, and then I'm going to come back to you. Right, so that whole thing happens for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and it's really, I think, the most powerful um, portion of the whole, the whole cycle. 
Um, and that's where that conferral takes place, which again is really at the heart of all of this, and that's why we focused our coaching around that. Um, and then lastly is just like a five minute share session. They bring them back to the rug, they reinforce the skill that they were practicing, and they ask, everybody wants to volunteer, but they ask maybe two students to share out their experiences and how the, using that strategy worked for them. What did they find difficult? What, how did it help them? Um, of course, everybody wants to share there, but the, the, but the teacher that really has control of this modality of instruction knows that, okay, we're going to take two pieces of feedback, we're going to recap, maybe we're going to talk about what we're doing tomorrow, but we're closing this down and we're going to move on. Um, so really, if they can keep it to 10 minutes at the beginning and five minutes at the end, they do have a nice chunk of time in the middle for the kids to be reading. Um, the generally word study would happen either prior to this or after. Most of the time I see it happening sort of as the opening uh, 15, 20 minutes of the literacy block. Um, teachers with a 90 minute block would not likely do reading and writing on the same day. That's just not possible. Um, so they'd have to sort of adjust uh, around that. Uh, with a two hour block you might be able to get reading and writing in, in, the, same, in the same block. So as I mentioned, we use the Calkins, Lucy Calkins units of study. These are highly research-based. Uh, we have already purchased in the district the units for reading and writing K through <coughs> five. Um, so teachers have them in their possession in their classrooms. Um, the, as I mentioned, we're continuing to grow our libraries. The units for Calkins are about five to six weeks, and there's usually four per grade level in reading and four in writing. Reading. Um, focuses both on fiction and nonfiction, or as she calls it, informational texts. Um, and then the writing components um, are focused on opinion, information, and narrative writing, which aligns with the Common Core standards. So, um, you know, if you think of, I, I, it may be exactly four per grade. I'm just not sure if there's a grade level in there that has three or a grade level that has five, but um, typically there's four per grade level. So in terms of implementation, if this makes sense, and I notice I had a typo, the last column should say 2020, 2021, not 2012. We're not going back in time in a time machine. But um, in 2016, we rolled out Reader's Workshop everywhere except K in grade two. I was not here then. I don't know if that was a budgetary decision or if we just felt those two grades were not prepared at that point. Um, but for any whatever reason, we rolled it out in sort of two groups. Um, and then the following year, K in grade two joined. Um, and then this year, um, everyone's either in year two or three of the rollout with coaching. And coaching <coughs> has happened all throughout, all the way back to 16. Um, in 1819, in you see WWPD, that's Writer's Workshop Professional Development. It was provided to all teachers in all grades, K through five, this year, in anticipation for next year. Um, and you can see here, this is sort of similar to what we did in 16-17. We're having a, a staggered rollout officially, a writer's workshop. Um, we will roll it out officially in grade one in grade three next year. That's the expectation. And then um, the other grades officially in 2021. However, <laughs> these grades here that are not officially rolling it out next year is, have the materials and have been told that they can use the materials if they see fit. Because there are many teachers in these four grades that are ready. They feel like they've got the workshop model under their belt. They don't need to wait another year so they can start to dabble in this. Um, but the official rollout for those four grades will be um, in 2021. Coaching will continue next year. Um, Likely also in 20 and 21, but we may be, that may be the year that we start to back off. Um, and then eventually it, it goes away. This is not something that we keep forever. Uh, once teachers get comfortable enough, then the coaching um, disappears. The workshop model itself has actually been so well received and successful that now we're considering helping teachers utilize it when they're teaching math. Um, it's not limited to any one curriculum or any one discipline. It's a teaching method that can be used or a model that can be used anywhere. A lot of school districts do utilize it for math and it does line up well with the Pearson math program that we have based on how those lessons are structured. So we actually could do that. And there are some teachers that do it um, knowingly and there are others that are structuring their lessons that way and not even realizing that it's lining up with sort of the, the concept of the workshop model. So that's not immediate, but that's something we're already in talks with um, to, to consider 
even if it's just to ask some teachers if they want to try it as sort of a study group. Like, let's say we get a group of you together to implement workshop at the for math. Like, you know, we can have a conversation and sort of push it out that way in a non-threatening way. So there's a lot of curriculum <laughs> work going on at the elementary school. So I'm very cognizant of that and trying not to um, overwhelm. We want to make sure that what we're doing, we're doing well, and teachers are feeling confident and comfortable, and they're executing um, the new programs the way they need to. So, um, you know, that's just important. This is something for us to always consider. So that's that's a very quick <laughs> overview of where we are with uh, relative to Reader's Workshop. Dr. McCain, any questions or comments? And where we're at and where we're going. We have a couple. Okay, Mrs. Bryson. Um, Dr. Regan, can you tell us a little bit about the TLA coaches and what types of coaching, but most importantly, how many sessions are they in each? Are they in each school? What is that? Can, I'm not sure I understand that completely. Yeah, so they're typically in each school for uh, what the equivalent of about four to six days in a school year. School year. Yeah, so they spread it out. They tend to come on a two day bunch so they'll come on a monday and a tuesday and then they'll be gone for six or eight weeks and they come back on another two consecutive days just so that they can sort of be there um, and do a variety of things now sometimes they're meeting with grade levels as a group uh, they're always doing individual coaching with teachers but if there's time in the day they might meet with the whole fifth grade and have a conversation about a particular item um, when they coach they either teach a lesson and model a lesson for a teacher they co-teach a lesson with a teacher, or the teacher takes the lead and then the coach sits after. So they, they plan the coaching sessions so that it's right before a teacher's prep, um, or free block, or you know, so that if the, the teacher can teach the lesson, then the coach can sit with them for 30 minutes after and give them the coaching that they need. They don't do it right in front of the kids, obviously. Um, so that's, that's generally what it looks like when they, when they come in to a building. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. Go ahead. This is my area, so absolutely. I get, um, sorry, I won't ask all of them. I'll just, ask, I'll just ask a couple <laughs> of more. Um, so one thing, so they, something about not doing reading and writing in the same day. Do you mean they're not doing reading and writing the same day, or they're just not doing it in the workshop model? So they're not. They're, right now, they're likely not doing it in the workshop model. We have some teachers that may be trying it right now. Um, and maybe I shouldn't have said the same day. I should have said like within that 90-minute 90 90 block minutes, okay. so teachers are finding other time to do it. But I'll be honest, like even given how much time there is, there will be days where they're not fitting both in in the same day, which, which goes back to this major issue around yeah. fixing that elementary very, schedule. Very block. problematic, especially as you're rolling out the writing workshop. Yeah. Because if it's not consistent mm -hmm. and then it doesn't roll out properly. So it's going to be important probably to think about timing, I would imagine, as you yes. as you stated a couple of times, mm -hmm. but definitely. And that question did come up at our at our PD in March with all, I was, I popped into I went almost all six buildings um, and the coaches were asked, I think in like three or four of the places I stopped, they asked that same, the, kid, the yeah. kids, the teachers asked that same question. Okay, we have to do this. We have 90 minutes. How do we do that, right? So they they had a, a very good answer, but like both of them have to happen. And basically, it's not going to be easy for you, but you need to find this time until they, meaning us, fix the schedule so that you have dedicated time in there. Um, I think they're also concerned because of the science piece that's going to be rolled out. You know, they're already teaching science, but not with a formal program. So I think you know, um, I do believe. Uh, Having looked at the schedules with principals and with Holly, it's not easy, but that there is a time, there is a way to capture time more effectively. We just had, I think the struggle is we share staff and we have this structure that we've talked about. We have these sister schools across town and it's just, it, that it's those things that get in the way and they shouldn't, right? These are the things that we shouldn't be worrying about, um, but they end up being these obstacles that we have to figure out a way around. So. When you're thinking of things in silos, it's so hard to, yes. so if we can, connect with more integration and so they're mm -hmm. connecting the reading and then it's not as hard to fit because if you think of science as so separate but you're not right. integrating it within literacy mm -hmm. it can feel like i don't have time to do these all effectively throughout yeah. the day but if i can really pull together and do some good units then it becomes a little bit mm -hmm. and obviously for the kids for them to to see it all coming exactly. together that it's not okay take off this hat and put this hat on but now i'm really thinking of 
I'm doing literacy, but I'm looking at it through a mm -hmm. scientist's eyes or something. Mm -hmm. And one of the science programs we're piloting, I won't say which because the pilot's not done yet, <laughs> does um, <laughs> highlight the fact that, and it's it's very clear, it's that they have um, they have literacy connections that are all Common Core connected. So like the teachers that were doing the pilot with that said, oh my gosh, like that directly links to this particular reading unit that we're doing, right? So. I think that was important for them to see. And then the other thing is the Calkins units of reading and writing do overlap too. So it's not, this is what the coaches were good at telling them. It's not that you need to dedicate 90 minutes of reading and 90 minutes of writing. There are units that, that connect in that, you know, within that 90 minute chunk, you're gonna be able to do both. Um, the decision for the teacher is whether or not you need more time with reading today than writing and vice versa. And, you know, again, if you have 120 minutes or more, it would make it even easier to make those decisions. And the units of study are, are they're intense. So teachers, part intense. of that work is also learning how to look through mm -hmm. it and pull out, but do it in a way that's consistent across mm -hmm. grade levels so that we're not doing the same thing twice or we're really right. elevating the, so it's, it's definitely, I mean, I think other programs are amazing, but yeah. it definitely takes time. Work, and I think yeah. a true commitment to the time and the day to do it, because if you're doing work, if you're doing writing workshop once a week, teachers aren't going right. to see what they need or even exactly. twice a week like I'm doing Monday and Friday or so I think putting that, that doing it even if you have the 30 minutes to do it daily is better than just push pushing it mm -hmm. off and doing it the two days mm -hmm. sorry so my one last two more questions the the so the reading workshop so I know that there were issues early on with books and having enough text it's not necessarily text in the library that didn't <clears throat> seem to be so much in the library for independent reading okay. but the texts were students were reading maybe a grade level text together. Mm -hmm. And so I, or have we resolved that as far as children having books in their hand when they are doing grade level work? Because, and is that being covered? Are they still being exposed to grade level text? They daily? are, so all the mentor texts that are used for each of the units are grade level. Um, as teachers are expanding their library, we've asked them to be cognizant of that as well and not just, you know, make sure that you are buying some level of readers, but you're, you're also increasing your own library of books that are being used um, while they're exposed to the metric text. Um, but you're right, it's not, um, it's a little different than sort of the anthology approach where they're, they're, they're not necessarily all when they're independent reading, reading at, at, a, at a, a grade level text, for example, they're reading something that's a just right book for them. Um, and that's one of the squeaky points of this method versus the other, right? So, um, but it is something that uh, I know Holly is really in tune with and making sure that she's giving that kind of feedback to teachers and, um, and the exposure to grade level text is really critically important and, and we're trying to even push it out into, as we're talking about science, again, like there's gonna be books that are gonna be associated with those units and kids should be exposed to grade level texts there as well. And so it's an ongoing, I think, um, effort to make sure that those, that exposure is there. Great. I'll save. <laughs> well, now I'm, I'll, sorry, I'll <laughs> talk to, well, no, thank no, you I'm very worried. much. That was very helpful, thank you. <laughs> Would anybody else like Mr. Rag still? Yeah, no, no, this is a good one. <laughs> yeah, it's good to, until it's next good to no, see no, no. the excitement and the passion for it. This is important stuff. Yeah. So, Mr. Ragsdale, your turn. All right, I have a few questions as well, so. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you mentioned in the, the rollout for Writer's Workshop is going to be staggered mm -hmm. um, over the next two years, but that, uh, and I, I, I don't remember now if you said that if it was most or all uh, of the teachers had the training, the professional development, oh, they, all uh, to, they all had. Um, and that some of them were choosing to do that. So given if they've all had the professional development, why are we rolling it out over two years as a staggered basis and not all next year? Yeah, so there, there's, um, there are different curriculum um, initiatives that are happening at different grade levels. So we were trying to be thoughtful around um, you know, the word study pilot, for example, in the intermediate schools in the, in the third grade. Um, there's the fact that um, K and two are a year behind the other grades with Reader's Workshop, so they're less, I'm gonna say less competent, but they have one less year under their belt of that than their counterparts in the other grades. So we were trying to mirror something there to, to be, to be fair to them to say, look, I mean, you've only had now two years of coaching in this model, we're not gonna layer on writer's workshop yet. 
Um, it's not a, it's, it doesn't work out perfectly, but that was sort of our thinking around trying to be fair to them um, and what this would look like as we, as we roll it out, wanting it to be as successful as possible. Um, you know, we, we did discuss uh, at the elementary curriculum leadership team, we did discuss two plans. One was sort of the rip off the Band-Aid plan and just say, everybody, we're going, we're going, get ready, hold on. Um, and, and I'll be honest, at the, um, at the intermediate level, um, you know, it's, it's been a harder transition for some of those teachers so uh, to go to workshop from sort of their traditional approach. And we were concerned about adding another layer onto that until they fully felt comfortable um, with the reader's workshop approach. So that's, that's sort of what worked into our decision to try and be thoughtful around which grades are pushed at which time, so. Okay. Um, they also mentioned that there's, uh, that this model can be used for math instruction as well, and that some people are uh, kind of playing, playing with that idea and structuring their lessons that way. Um, what is the, I'm trying to sort of think in my mind how that's going to, how that looks in a classroom. What is the equivalent of kind of quiet private reading um, in, a sure. math, in a math lesson? Yeah, so it's probably less about that than it is about using um, stations, right? So if our, the way the Pearson program works is it has a, a 10 minute focus lesson, which you know, sometimes includes a video, but we're at the rug, we're learning this um, concept, and then they're going out either to stations um, to do different activities that focus around that um, particular skill or concept, or teachers are breaking them up into deliberate groups based on um, their needs, and they're spending that chunk of time um, doing that. So it's not necessary. I mean, it is. It's independent practice and group practice, but it's not the same as reading, where they're sort of sitting quietly doing. Um, math facts. Um, it's it's it, you know kindergarten in particular. Um, if you go there, it's always stations. So they have four places where they're going to practice different, you know, using manipulatives or you know whatever they're doing different things like that. You see that less as they get older, but that's really what that 30, 40 minutes is. It's small group work or some independent work or I need six of you to come over and work with Mrs. So and so, um, and you guys are going to work in pairs, that kind of thing. So. There's not the conferring piece necessarily as formal, but um, that, that's sort of how, how I've seen it in the, the classrooms that are doing it in district now. Okay. Um, I, I'm, I, I would see the conferring could still be very it relevant. Could happen, yeah. The, but it's not, it's not part, so what, what's happening, what they're doing now is, is you're not seeing that, like they're not making that mm -hmm. transition where they have their conferral notes and they're doing that, but it certainly could be applied. The yeah, the conferring example. part I think makes complete sense. Yeah. I think that, yeah, the, that equivalent of what, the, what they do while they go, mm -hmm. if they go away, well, I can no. see it, but I see how that would be adapted. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when, when the students are doing their independent reading, I know that there's this concept of finding like the just right book for you mm -hmm. uh, and that they're instructed to kind of you know open open to a page and read a couple paragraphs and see it's it's generally based on how many words do you not know like mm -hmm. if there are too many words you don't know that's too hard for you yep. if you know all the words that's too easy for you and you're trying to find some kind of balance there I mean I know that it's you know, a proxy that, you know, trying to find a shorthand way, it's kind of hard to know the difficulty of a book without actually reading the whole book because there's more than just vocabulary that sure. contributes to difficulty. Some books have, uh, you know, everything is just right on the surface and other books you're reading a little bit between the lines and mm. it's not always about vocabulary. Is, are we generally finding that that's been uh, useful or effective? This might be getting a little too much into the weeds, but um, I'm just wondering how useful we're finding that as a proxy for getting students into the right kinds of books. Yeah, I mean, that would be probably a better question if Holly were here tonight. She could probably answer it a lot better than I could. Um, it, certainly when I've been in classrooms and I hear the term just write books, which is what they use, um, th I haven't had any uh, feedback from teachers saying like, yeah, well, this is not an effective way for kids to find the books that they should be reading. Um, but I, I can't give you any more detail than that. It's something I certainly could ask um, Holly's opinion on, and we could we could circle back around that. But um, yeah. I've been really happy here in town to not see go to your go to your blue basket or go to this basket or where kids are actually learning how to choose appropriate books because that is a skill. And when they go to bookstores or libraries, they do need to choose from a 
an unlabeled essential, right? And so I think when, when there's some buildings where, in, not in, in our town, but where things are very, it's like you can only choose from this particular basket, that can be really difficult for children. One, they have no choice or ownership, but two, they're not actually developing the skill to choose a book that's just right. So I think that it's exciting not to see it broken down in like, this is your level basket and this you can only go from the top shelf, but the rest of you can choose from here. So I would urge us to stay kind of on that on that track, but but I hear your point. Yeah, teachers are really cognizant of how the, because they have to label them in some way so they can see, mm -hmm. but what they use to sort of monitor what level the book is, is they're really careful to make sure it's not sort of segregated in a way that I know I can only read from this bin or, you know. Great. Any other questions or comments? I know, this is exciting <laughs> stuff. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and, and yes, thank you to, uh, to Dr. Regan for the intention here again is in perspective is around a spotlight into the work that you help support and which ultimately is here driving uh, at each and every meeting. Um, I will just make a, a, a comment that was noted just a couple of moments ago and, and uh, uh, Dr. Regan alluded to the, uh, I'm trying to think about the right word, but maybe abundance. There's a, there is an abundance of work that um, Dr. Regan walked into and I've become aware of here in the district, all very good planning, all very good work, particularly at the elementary level. Uh, these, these sort of two, highlight two, if you will, the readers and writers piece. Uh, there is an awful lot more that uh, is in the planning phases, is, is being planned through the implementation phase, and uh, certainly Dr. Regan has more than had, in, in addition to acclimating to the district and to his role, understanding the work that he needs to do and has been doing uh, very, very earnestly with principals to plan what's to come. Um, and it's a little daunting uh, to think about uh, beyond just the workshop model, but more to come around science and social studies uh, in addition to this is the foundation that's there. So it's with intention to share more of that with you because I think it's important that you're aware of it. Um, uh, I, I'm aware of it, certainly not to the level that, 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 that Dr. Regan is, but uh, it is a focal point of the, the work of this district. And again, all, uh, all good work, all good programming, but uh, some heavy lifting that's begun and that will need to continue. So. Uh, Mr. Ragsdale, your question around sort of the, a, a great one around, so why not everyone at one time? And I, as you start to become in tune with where we have been recently at the elementary level and where we are out of necessity going, there's a lot that's at play here. Um, uh, and, and certainly more to come on all of that, but just uh, I want to thank again Dr. Regan for his work uh, beyond just this, but I can tell you when you hear him say he is in those classrooms, he is in those classrooms, I'm pleased to be able to say I. I'd be able to see a lot of what he's described here tonight, but uh, but thank you for your, I do just your work. Say, I feel like I left it out. The teachers have worked very, very hard yeah. over the past. Yes, uh, they four. absolutely have. And I don't want that to be a miss in my presentation. They they really have bought into this and are working very hard to, to adopt this and do this right. So um, I just want to recognize that. And, and, and that's evident, last piece, it's evident where uh, I've had the pleasure to be just this week in, in multiple classrooms in two different buildings at two very different grade levels, and this you see is happening. Uh, it's, 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 it's quite something. So. Great. Thank you. Mr. Ragsdale, you've got uh, I just eye. want to quickly follow on that. I was not implying we should have been <laughs> rolling out all oh, the no. ones. Um, because the yeah, thoughtful implementation is as important as having a good plan or a good you know, system and curriculum in the first place. Yeah. Um, that uh, you know, people when we're prepared to roll it out effectively, um, is when we'll see the results from it. Mrs. Burns, could I ask? I know back several years ago we had a. Uh, forgive me if I don't get the title correctly. A curriculum review uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. um, I think what would be helpful going at, once we get to that point, because I know there's a lot of work that has to be done and um, to move forward to get us to where we need to be. But I think um, that was very helpful, I know, for myself, mm -hmm. in becoming more familiar with what um, the <coughs> process, just, just seeing the mapping, what the process is for um, curriculum review and renewal, along with what programs um, are coming up for revisit. So I mean, for those who will be joining us after next week, I think it's very helpful to kind of get a broad mm -hmm. look as to um, what grades um, we're doing certain 
programs as these as we roll out with the new science curriculum and social studies and civics and all that I think at that juncture I think that would be helpful so that we can kind of see and kind of follow along as you guys continue to hammer out and work and um, enrich our, our programming so, so if I may I'll, I'll speak for for our assistant superintendent here because he probably won't say it that that is uh, together uh, he's worked hard to put uh, a draft together so stay tuned for that okay. because uh, it is more than in the works and important for, uh, I think, all to see, uh, not just our, our, our teachers, of course, uh, but our instructional leaders, and it can't hurt for you to see it as well. Fantastic, so, great. Yeah. great. Any other comments or questions? This was a good one for us. I love it. All right. <laughs> great, great, great. All right, moving on to our third item under new business this evening, which is the superintendent evaluation. Um, I want to acknowledge that the, the superintendent of public schools is one of the few positions, the few roles, where their evaluation must be done publicly. It's actually required by law. And as a HR professional, I always had a trouble with that, right? Because I had always been taught you praise in public, you criticize in private. And the, rev the review process was something that very secretive, behind the scenes, behind closed doors sort of thing. Um, so as a school committee member um, going through this process, I have always found this very challenging. So I'll just, just acknowledge that. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, but that, that is the case that we find ourselves in. But I would say over the course of this year, um, I truly believe as a committee and as an administrative team, we have been very transparent about this process. We brought Dorothy Presser in from MASC early on in our school year to walk us through the recommended process and procedures, and she gave us some good suggestions on how to attack this process. Dr. Brand, through, through his work, has provided regular updates and check-ins to us. So I feel quite confident this evening that there are no surprises. Okay, again, public process. Uh, tonight we will be, um, I will be reading and we will be discussing the summative evaluation. Um, and if people have been paying attention, this final document has actually been sitting on the district's website for the past week. <laughs> so Dr. Brand's already seen it. Um, but just to give you a little, little summary of, of the process that we used, a couple of weeks ago, the seven of us completed individual evaluations on Dr. Brand. That's what our thoughts were. We used the same format, literally the same form, and we were reviewing him as individuals on his goals and the four indicators. Um, we as a committee chose to use a subcommittee to pull those seven evaluations into one final document. Um, our subcommittee was comprised of myself, Mrs. Bryson, and Mrs. Newhouse. We met uh, recently to tackle the project of taking seven individual reviews and putting them together into one. Um, not as hard as we thought it was gonna be, right? It was very, actually pretty easy. Um, but for, for the public and for the rest of the committee members that weren't with us, I just thought I'd share how we tackled it. Very simple. We literally sat in the conference room at the Roman House. We took copies of those seven evaluations, laid them out in front of us. Thank you, I don't want to whack your, <laughs> I don't want to whack your computer. Uh, we tallied up the ratings and double checked them to make sure that, that we were consistent. And the ratings that we chose um, was majority rules. And the good news is, is that we were all very consistent. So we were, the majority was truly the majority. Um, and then we tackled the comment sections. Again, um, I was quite pleased to see that as seven individuals, we were all very consistent in the meaning and the intention behind our comments. We referred to samples of work, we referred to evidence, we referred to meetings and things that were presented to us publicly. Um, and we all were saying pretty much the same thing. We might have chosen different wording, but we all pretty much said the same thing, and that's pretty impressive. So thank you to each one of you for participating in that process. Um, so with that, I'm gonna take the group through the review. I'm not gonna read it word for word, because we'd be here for probably another couple hours, but I'm certainly gonna share the highlights. 
Again, this document is available and has been available to the public. It is on the district's website. A signed copy will be retained at the Roman House as well as our individual evaluations. Okay. So first off, I'm gonna start with the performance goals because those were the three goals, remember, at the beginning of the year Dr. Brand proposed to us. We talked about them pretty extensively over the course of the year. We actually had to vote to accept those as his goals. So if you go to page three, if you wanna follow along in your, your packets, the printout copies that we gave, um, the first was the professional practice goal, the completion of the superintendent entry plan. And under that for bullets, things that we considered, uh, Dr. Barron was to familiarize himself with the people and programs that, that defined the Wilmington educational community. He was developing an understanding about the things that WPS stakeholders are proud of and believe are su successful hallmarks of the school system. He was looking to identify the critical issues that represent areas of concerns that stakeholders believe need to be addressed and completing a district scan that helps think of, help him inform his future and long-term and short-term planning for the district. And he also was going to present those findings to the school committee, which he did. So if you look at the ratings, our choices were did not meet, some progress, significant progress, met or exceeded, and his overall rating towards that performance goal was met. Under the student learning goal, which was the coordinated program review corrective action plan, again, something that we've talked about a lot this year and have received regular updates, obviously the progress monitoring, the presentation of a mid-year report, and a presentation of the end of year summary on the work that's been completed in compliance with our obligations. Again, that's something that we know that is ongoing, but we have had regular updates on. Um, same five choices for ratings, and again, our overall rating was that he met that goal. And thirdly, the district improvement goal, which was the strategic plan development. That's the oversight of the process that involves stakeholders throughout our community to embark upon developing our new strategic plan, establishing the foundation of the work ahead, um, and the plan for that to be presented to us for approval prior to the end of this school year. And I know that we're pretty, pretty close to having that completed. So again, the same five choices for ratings, um, and we as a group chose significant progress towards that goal. And then we jump into the performance ratings for the standards of which there are four. The first one is instructional leadership. There are five different indicators for that standard, curriculum, instruction, assessment, evaluation, and data-informed decision-making, and right down the line um, was a proficiency rating, and of, their, of which there are four choices, unsatisfactory, needs improvement, proficient, or exemplary. Straight down the line, proficient there. Um, and I do want to make note of, of some of the highlighted comments. Superintendent Brand has demonstrated excellent leadership during his first year in the Wilmington Public School District. He has spearheaded many initiatives to ensure that our curriculum is aligned to state frameworks and is meeting the needs of all learners. In his entry report, Dr. Brand also identified the overall consistency of the, w Public, the Wilmington Public Schools curriculum and the school and classroom experience across the district as items of concern that need to be addressed. And I think on the standards, it might be helpful. I can read them, certainly, but if there's anyone who would like to add anything to that from the committee, you're welcome to. Anybody for standard one? No? Okay. Standard two refers to management and operations. And again, there are five indicators under standard two. Environment, human resources management and development scheduling and management information systems, law, ethics, policies, and finally, fiscal systems. Again, the same four choices for ratings, and we gave Dr. Brand a rating of proficient for standard number two, management and operations. 
And again, I'd like to, to read some comments here. Superintendent Brand has shown strong management skills in the administration of Wilmington Public Schools. Dr. Brand has provided regular and consistent progress updates on his performance goals, demonstrating his ability to develop and execute plans. He has worked closely with the Human Resources Manager to provide timely updates on personnel reports and the Director of Finance to prepare and propose our annual budget. Together with his leadership team, Dr. Brand recommended a budget that is supportive of our district goals with a firm understanding of and respect for Wilmington's available resources. So that's standard number two. Anything anyone would like to add or comment on? Okay. Standard number three is family and community engagement. And again, there's several indicators there for, to be exact, engagement, sharing responsibility, communication, and family concerns. All of us were consistent in saying a rating of proficient for standard number three. And I'd like to read some comments under that. The school committee is in consensus that family and community engagement is an area of strength for Superintendent Brand. Dr. Brand has worked diligently to engage and communicate effectively with families and all community members this year. He has quickly established his presence in the district as being a strong leader with excellent communication skills as evidenced by his frequent and thoughtful emails, his Twitter feed, his responses to community and national issues, as well as his detailed superintendent report at all school committee meetings. And the final comment here I'd really like to read because I, I thought it was quite touching. Most impressive, though, is how Dr. Brand shows great compassion towards students, families, staff, and community members in all situations. And finally, the standard number four, which is professional culture. There are several indicators under the professional culture standard. Commitment to high standards, cultural proficiency, communication, continuous learning, shared vision, and managing conflict. And again, our overall rating for this standard was proficient. And again, I can read a couple of the comments. Superintendent Brandt has taken steps to foster a strong professional culture within Wilmington Public Schools. He has been diligent in building trust and positive working relationships within our school district. He truly leads by example, and the staff can see it. Dr. Brandt has shown the importance of engaging and including all stakeholders in the work of the district. And then finally, you go back towards the front, you'll see on the cover page are the overall uh, ratings that we just spoke of. But I'd really like to include the final comments. And there's, there's quite a number of them, but I think they're very important to share. So bear with me. <laughs> Superintendent Brand has quickly become a respected leader and has brought much needed stability to the district. Well, only in his 10th month as superintendent, Dr. Brand has prepared and presented a thorough entry plan, has supervised the coordinated program review corrective action plan, and has spearheaded the district-wide strategic planning committee. The entry plan demonstrated Dr. Brand's high level of understanding of the community in such a short time. Since beginning his role as superintendent in July, Dr. Brand has worked tirelessly to build strong relationships with all faculty, students, families, school committee, and community members. His attention to detail is impressive, and his ability to manage many short and long-term projects simultaneously should be commended. Dr. Brand's judgment and experience have enabled him to make good decisions about where to prioritize his time and attention. He has acted swiftly and deliberately in areas where he perceived a need to start work immediately, such as reviewing the middle school program of studies and addressing the structure of the Office of Student Support Services. It's a good thing we approved that. Huh? <laughs> 
It is clear that Dr. Brandt has made a positive impact on our district, and we are enthusiastic about the continued development of the strategic plan. We are confident that this plan will guide our continued success and progress under Dr. Brand's leadership. So there you go. Does anybody from the committee like to add anything? I would Mrs. Just Burns. I'd like to thank the committee for, it's not an easy task to combine seven, as you had said, seven um, pers well, uh, evaluations to cohesively represent, represent, I mean, it was so smooth in the combination of all seven of our comments. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I had a call, I actually called Mrs. Newhouse. I'm like, Mrs. Newhouse, what was the methodology of putting this together? Yeah. You know, it's kind of, it's definitely what I said, but not how I said it. And mm -hmm. she's like, oh, well, since we all were on the same page, we kind of, and I have to commend you all for the time, because it, it, it is quite the task to do. And um, I think it came out um, absolutely the final, final report, lovely, and very um, representative of, I know how I mm -hmm. uh, feel about this year's um, work um, and your uh, uh, tasks, because I know it wasn't an easy task walking into uh, Wilmington, but we're <laughs> grateful for all the work that you've done this year. Absolutely. Anyone else like to? Mr. Ragsdale. Uh, so you mentioned that it, uh, that it's available on our website, and yes. I just wanted to add that it's on the superintendent's page exactly. of our website yep. in case anyone wants to uh, go and find it. Finding things we, on our we website. We're trying to make it easy for finding things on our website find, isn't always easy. Sometimes that's where to things go. can get a little little buried. I could tweet it if you want. There you go. <laughs> Please do. Please do. <laughs> Absolutely. Sure. It's like putting it on a refrigerator, right? Being I actually proud have to of think it. about that. <laughs> <laughs> No, we are, we are very happy. I think this year, um, in some ways, was very easy to do the evaluation because we were very consistent. Um, didn't know what to expect, you never know. Um, but we did receive lots of regular updates so if people were paying attention. The information was there for us, um, and you made it easy. So there you, you go. Okay, so what I'm going to do is pass around a official summative evaluation and by signing this this means this is our way of accepting it this copy will be retained in the roman house as will our signed individual evaluations and if you haven't had a chance to sign your individual one please do so okay any other questions comments no? Are the individual ones online or are they only in the No, those house? are not online, but they are available and will be retained at the Roman House. All right. Excellent. And while we're, we're doing that, public comment. Anybody like to say anything? Ask any questions? <laughs> Mr. Talbot. Um, I just want to make a statement since sure. this is my last meeting. Uh, this is my last meeting as a uh, Wilmington School Committee member. The past three years have been very enlightening and educational for me to see what goes into running a school system. Uh, I've, I have a, a much greater appreciation for all the hard work that they do. I feel very lucky to have been a part of this process. I'd like to take a moment to thank the wonderful past, present, uh, Wilmington School Committee members, David, Joe, uh, Jen, Julie, Steve, MJ, uh, Steve's not here tonight, but um, for donating their time for such an important role um, for the town of Wilmington. I also would like to personally thank Dr. Brand for a strong leadership role as a superintendent, uh, Assistant Superintendent Brian Re Regan for all your hard work. And it's a lot, it's, I can tell it's hard, those PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> um, Paul Rogerio, um, there's no words to describe how vital you have been uh, during my term as school committee member for the town of Wilmington. Uh, in the brief time I've known you, you've done amazing things to keep this, uh, everything running smoothly, and I expect you will continue to do so going forward. Um, I would also like to thank the amazing support staff of the Roman House that goes far and above to get the job done on a daily basis, like Jack, Jackie Raffi, Jen uh, Contrada, um, Tristan Dixie, 
uh, Michelle McLaren and Lynn Morrison. I would like to give all a huge shout out to the principals at the, um, the schools and the support staff for all the hard work they do on a daily basis. The teachers of Wilmington Public Schools are the best in the world. Uh, I am so proud to say that I live in this community uh, that it goes an extra mile to make sure the kids get the best education possible. I want to wish the returning and newest members, Joellen, uh, Jesse, and Jason, um, all the best in the upcoming terms in the Wilmington School Committee uh, members. I know you each will bring your own unique perspectives to the, com the committee. I hope you, everyone gets out on, to vote this Saturday and attend the town meeting May 4th, 1030. Thank you. Anybody from the public like to offer any comments, questions? No? All right. Like Tom, tonight is my last meeting as well, and I just want to say it's been an honor and privilege to serve the children and the families of Wilmington. I truly mean that. Um, when I first campaigned, my alley was a fourth grader at the West, and now we're looking at colleges. So it's been a, a long road. Um, we've, we've certainly experienced a lot as, as a committee. Um, some committees never see some of the things that we've seen, but I'm very happy of the place that we're in, and I feel as though Tom and I are, are turning over the reins to an excellent group of people that will take our district in the right direction and on to the future. So thank you for the opportunity, and yes, everybody needs to get out to vote. I already voted. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. I love that absentee ballot thing. It's fabulous. All right, subcommittee reports. No, you go first. Um, just briefly, um, I'll be attending May 1st's Day on the Hill, which happens every year through MASC, where we talk about the uh, issues that are facing our state in, in, as it pertains to education. Um, I had meant to kind of open this at the last meeting, but of which I couldn't attend. But um, if anybody has any point, and I, I think I'd like to touch base with you too, um, sure. Superintendent Brand, with regards to any points, um, I will be meeting with, uh, I know at least Representative Robertson. Um, I, I still have to reach out to Senator Tarr's office. At the very least, I'm gonna uh, stop in and um, say hello, but um, if there's anything of interest that uh, you'd like me to share with them or, to, or bring to their attention, I'd be more than happy to, to share that. Um, but I just wanted to invite that um, open that up to the rest of the board members. I apologize for not being here earlier to kind of bring you before some folks had a time to think about it and discuss it. So, but I just wanted to bring it now and go from there. Any questions or thoughts for Mrs. Burns? Mrs. Bryson. So this is not an official subcommittee report, but some of us have been working a little behind the scenes to, to thank both you and Tom for your incredible work and dedication and commitment to the town of Wilmington. We, um, it's bittersweet, mostly bitter, but, um, but we have tried to come up with something to just say a, a true, genuine thank you. Thank you for your commitment, thank you for your leadership, thank you for being here. And it's not just in this room that you do this work, but it is many of, I, people knew the amount of hours that go in beyond this one meeting. It's truly um, just to be surrounded by such exceptional people and to know that you've devoted this much time and, and more people are here waiting to throw there, to get involved in this. And it's just very exciting to thank be you. a part of this. So it is so apropos that we did the evaluation tonight and I feel really good that we were able to sort of tie that up as is your last meeting as chair and you do know you will be greatly missed oh, thank you. so thank you very we much. um we know how much you love all the places you'll go <laughs> <laughs> since I think you've pulled that book out at least three times oh, since at least. I have if been not, on the committee at least if not further than and that and so yeah. with the help of my fellow committee members we put together our own version called Goodbye, Julie and Tom by the Wilmington School Committee, inspired by All the Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. Congratulations, today is the day. We're not sure we're ready, but you're off and away. Julie, you've guided us through storms, soared with us to high heights, 
there was nothing we couldn't accomplish once set in your sights. Tom, you asked the good questions and helped us to see things we might have missed and made us a stronger committee. You've both devoted hours to making our schools grand, approving a new homework policy, and hiring Superintendent Brandt. <laughs> the places we've been to, the hurdles we've jumped, your departure's not easy, in truth we're a bit stumped, but you've guided us well and strengthened this team. We'll carry on working to fulfill your great dream. So did you succeed? Yes, you did indeed. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Well, don't really get on your way, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we have oh, thank you. two beautiful plaques and a cardstock copy of, of your poem. Oh, thank so, you. So, and I'll just, can I read this out loud? Absolutely. So it's presented to Mrs. Julie Broussard in honor of her dedicated commitment to the students of the Wilmington Public Schools for service on the Wilmington School Committee 2013 through 2019. So, thank you. Congratulations. Can we get a picture of that? You should get a picture of you. With that. Okay. That, that you should there you go. Sweet. That right. can go on your Twitter Excellent. feed. Thank you. And then Tom presented That's to really Mr. Sweet. Thomas Talbot in honor of his dedicated commitment to the students of the Wilmington Public Schools for service on the Wilmington School Committee 2016 through 2019. Thank you. And Mrs. Burns picked up a lovely cake that we'll be able to enjoy after the meeting. And as you know, Ms. Dixie did order, oh, thank you, um, coffee, yes. and there's water out there. So oh, we can enjoy you. that after for our, our party. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Otherwise known as the executive session. <laughs> Otherwise known as the executive <laughs> session, but an executive session is better with cake and coffee. So. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I really am truly touched. Very nice. Thank you. Um, any correspondence? No? None this evening. None this evening. Okay, great. Um, future school committee meeting dates and notable agenda items. I did uh, request to put back on the agenda school committee reorganization. We kind of talked about just the situation that we're in at our last meeting. Didn't really make any decisions, but I wanted to be transparent about where we're at. Um, this is the first time in a long time that the chair will not be here um, for both the town meeting and for the next meeting for reorganization. So there's ways that you can handle that for sure, but I did want to acknowledge that. Mrs. Burns, you weren't here at our last meeting when I first brought this up. And Mr. Bjork isn't here this evening. <laughs> so we can't, we're kind of stuck. <laughs> but anyway, I, I wanted to just acknowledge that. Um, my suggestion certainly for town meeting um, certainly is up to the committee, but Mrs. Bryson is the vice chair. Um, it's simply reading the articles that represent the schools at town meeting that seems appropriate. And I would, not that it matters, but I would agree um, okay. with, with that decision. Okay, so that's a simple way to handle that. <laughs> Aren't you lucky? So <laughs> Very lucky. Um, and at the next school committee meeting, which is when we traditionally do the uh, school committee reorganization, again, you won't have a chair. So the, um, I think the simple solution on that one is to have Dr. Brand open the meeting and after the Pledge of Allegiance and any student presentation that you might have, um, go right into the reorganization at that point if folks are comfortable with that. Okay, I see some nodding heads. Is there a reason that we would do that rather than just have Jen open the meeting as vice chair and However, it, that's also chair? an option. It's what people are comfortable with. It's just what we've done in the past. I, I think that's, that's right, that typically the chair doesn't typically nominate Herself, the, the chair <laughs> role so in the past when we have reorganized it has been the superintendent it's the first mm -hmm. thing we um, we pick so that the chair for the upcoming year will then drive the rest of the reorganization um, uh, discussion right. so if I'm correct right um, and we at that same meeting we have also tackled uh, subcommittee assignments mm -hmm. Um, people may or may not be ready to do that at that meeting, and that's that's okay. Um, to our soon-to-be new members, bearing no strange things happening in the election, um, you, you're certainly welcome to start thinking about what you might be interested in doing. Um, and we did acknowledge at our last meeting, we've all been there. We know how awkward it is to be at your very first meeting and be asked to choose 
a chair, vice chair, and secretary. We've been there. I, that happened to me my very first meeting, and I passed because I didn't know what to do, and then I quickly caught, caught on. Um, so I just I wanted to acknowledge that and, and certainly bring it forward to the public as well that this is a slightly unique situation we're in, but it's okay. We can handle it. So there you go. So our next two meetings, we've got a meeting on May 8th, and then we've got one on May 22nd. Um, we are coming to the point in the year where it's all the fun things, the concerts, the art shows, um, elementary literacy night. So uh, item number 12 on our agenda, you'll see listing of some great dates ahead. I want to point out two little changes under item E. Um, May 7th is actually the band concert. I think the annual Pops concert has already happened, perhaps. Um, but May 7th will be the band concert here in this building in the gym. I believe it starts at 7 o'clock. That is something that all the public is welcome to, but certainly school committee members as well. And then on May 9th, the Strings Orchestra will be presenting their vertical concert. That will take place, I, I believe it, it's in the Benton Auditorium. That's what I saw on the, on the school calendar. And I believe that's also a 7 o'clock start time. But this is, this is the fun time of year. Sure. Chromebook night, are we supposed to attend that? No. no. Okay. No. Okay, just thank you. Informational. Okay. I'm like, ooh, what's that? Ooh, do you want to <laughs> go? <laughs> like, Isn't that when they just set everyone's Chromebook up? <laughs> do I really need to be there for that? Yes, okay. you do. <laughs> All righty, and our last item this evening on our agenda is an executive session um, from which we will not return to public session. The motion here is the Wilmington School Committee will vote to enter into public session pursuant to the law, ex I'm sorry, executive session, thank you, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. And in this case, this is the time of year when we do the administrative salaries. Um, so the motion before us is that motion that I just read with the understanding that we will not return to public session. We will conclude from there. Mrs. So Burns, so moved. Is there a second? Mrs. Newhouse, I saw your hand first, and this requires a roll call vote. Mrs. Bryson? Yes. Mrs. Burns? Yes. Mrs. Newhouse? Yes. Mr. Ragsdale? Yes. Mr. Talbot? Yes. And myself, Mrs. Broussard? Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.